Our guest in this segment is Steve Wendelin. He is the Democratic nominee for the House of Representatives. He will go against Riley Moore in the November election. Steve, good morning. Thanks for coming in. Good morning. Thanks for having me back so soon. He's got the rank of commander, so I expect the two of you to be on your best <laughs> behavior in questioning him. All right. Well, now you know your opponent. What do you think? Um, I couldn't be happier. I am actually, uh, Riley is who I wanted to run against. Um, so I need to be honest here. Um, I really didn't want to run against General Walker. His character is completely unimpeachable. Uh, Nate Kane and Joe Early, both nice guys. I don't agree with their politics, but all three of them are really decent guys. Riley comes with some baggage and I think gives me pretty much the best shot at pulling this off. What are the points about Riley that you think you can take advantage of? Well, first, let me get back to something that happened with General Walker during the primary. Uh, his organization went after his service, specifically questioning his combat service. Um, I've subsequently have spoken with General Walker. It's really ironic. We were actually at the same command at the same time in Iraq. All right. I know exactly where he is. He knew exactly where I was. And to question him on something like that. And oh, by the way, if anyone wants to question, you know, my combat tour, well, I'll be happy to uh, place my bronze star somewhere inside of them. And they'll need a miner's headlamp to uh, find it. And to be clear, so, it, it wasn't Riley who made the uh, uh, points. It was somebody associated with his campaign. Yes. And, and here's the thing, though. It's about accountability and leadership. If someone from your organization says something that isn't correct or you don't agree with, you reprimand them or fire them, and then you come out with a public apology, um, or you double down on it. Riley did neither. Um, those people, you have to be accountable as a leader. Okay, he leads that campaign. So everything that happens on that watch is his responsibility. So... That it wasn't handled well at all. The word was when he initially announced, and then there were a few other minor candidates, that at that time, his approval rating among those who would be voting in the Republican primary was anywhere from 80 to 90 percent. Uh, he ended up winning with 45 percent of the vote. Do you read anything into that? It yeah, was a crowded I, field. Yeah, it was a crowded field. However, that's 55 percent that didn't vote for him. You know, he's going off of also when I was out there stumping and running into all these other Republicans, we'd run into each other all the time. Riley was MIA. Um, he's running on his name and he's running on a ton of money. Uh, quite frankly, I think what he wants to do is just kind of ignore everybody and just think that he's going to coast into this. And that's not going to happen. I'm not going to let it happen. In a tight house right now in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. Tight Senate as well. Balance of power can shift on a couple of seats. In a state as red as West Virginia, why do you think people would vote for a Democrat out of fear of moving the speaker's gavel to the other side, so to speak? Why do you think they would vote for a Democrat in your race? Well, you know, that, that's pretty strategic thinking. You need to look at this at a local level. And Riley says, well, I want to run on my record. Okay, let's talk about his record. One of his programs is called the Hope Scholarship. All that is is a charter school initiative. They're taking money out of public schools, all right, and giving it to people for alternative education. If you want, to, if you want your children to be taught in a parochial school or private school, that's fine. But you don't gut the public schools for it. By the way, of the 27 counties, uh, let me just check my notes here. Yeah, it's of the 27 counties in the 2nd Congressional District, 12 of them, their leading employers are the school districts. By voting for Riley Moore, you're basically voting to lose your job or have your pay cut, all right, in those, in those uh, counties. That's ridiculous. In addition, um, most of the counties, their top employers are government. Quite frankly, what I don't understand is this. West Virginians live blue. They vote red. They really need to start examining that and looking at what these people are actually doing, not just what they're saying. Mr. Bodwell. 
Um, well, let me let me ask this. You say live blue, vote red. Under the, the blue administration, we've had a ridiculous uh, amount of inflation for whatever reason. And that has taken people who are lower income. And we are a state of people with a lot, a lot of people with low income. And that's made it a heck of a lot harder for them to live. It's made it a heck of a lot harder for them to eat. So, I mean, I, I think Living Blue has not done that well for these people right now. How do you differentiate yourself as far as there are the, the National Party, Joe Biden and everybody mm-hmm. else? There's there have been a lot of radical ideas that really don't resonate well at all in West Virginia. How do you differentiate yourself from those ideas? Well, first off, the Biden administration, their biggest weakness is they just have a horrible PR and marketing department. The infrastructure money, how you, you see all this construction going on. I mean, you know, that's not that's not Jim Justice saying, oh, yeah, let's fix up West Virginia. Those are federal dollars coming in. I don't know how many bridges I've crossed that are being repaired or rebuilt. Um, the money is flowing into West Virginia and it's coming from at the federal level. As far as the inflation goes, I know everyone wants to blame the administration. It comes down to this. Things got inflated during COVID. Got it. Supply chain issues. Got it. Here's the problem is a lot of this is artificial inflation. It's because of, quite frankly, it's corporate greed. And it has to be checked. I'm sorry, the Republican Party doesn't do that. All right. What they do is they have the they take the governors off and they go for that whole free market thing. The problem is, is this isn't even pure capitalism because we have so many monopolies in this country. You're you know, you're in the healthcare industry, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um should there in a free market system, shouldn't there be basically one one set amount, you know, uh just because I go in and I buy a gallon of milk for two bucks, Matt, because Matt is coming in from a different industry does he have to pay more for a gallon of milk that's nuts because that's what's happened um in our healthcare industry is you have negotiated rates but if i have to pay out of pocket it's i don't you tell me how much more is it if i have to pay out of pocket well i mean i I can tell you just from my experience the healthcare industry the pharmaceutical industry that is all the fault of both parties because every party, when they are getting ready to get elected, oh, we're gonna we're gonna make the pharmaceutical companies negotiate with Medicare. We're gonna do this. We're gonna do that. And there's so much money that flows in from the healthcare industry to both sides that nobody really ever puts a puts the gavel down on the healthcare industry. You are absolutely right. It, it is. Um, hey, you want a job? <laughs> yeah, you are absolutely right. And again, it's the flow of money. I've said this before, and I keep saying it. It's not the biggest problem. It's the first problem, and that is money in politics. Um, Riley has raised close to $900,000 for this race. That's insane. And almost all of it is corporate PAC money, special interests. It's not small donors. How much have you raised, Steve? I think I'm at about... 12 grand. How much do you think it'll take to run and, and win a race of this size? I don't know. I think uh, probably about 60 grand. And if I can do, if I can beat him with 60 grand to his, probably by then he'll be at a million. Um, won't that be a hell of a story? That'll be revolutionary. Steve, let me just follow up just my original question. Yeah. How do you differentiate yourself from the National Democratic Party? Well, first of all, Steve Williams is right. Um, there, there has been the Democratic Party has lost touch with rural America. Um, there's a, a, a young lady uh, up in Maine. Her name is uh, uh, oh god, I just blanked on it. Uh, Maxman. Her last name is Maxman, and she wrote a book called Dirt Rope Revival. She actually ran successfully for first their House of Delegates and then their State Senate. And basically, she divorced herself from the, the National Democratic Party and just went back to the Democratic roots of taking care of the, the community. During COVID, she took her campaign engine, and instead of campaigning, she went out and made sure people had groceries. 
And that's how we need to do it. The Democrats have to get back to their roots, which is taking care of each other, taking care of our community. And until the DNC and the DCCC, okay, get back on board with that, I don't have a whole lot of use for them. Quite frankly, they don't have a whole lot of use for me. Well, unfortunately, electing you as Mm -hmm. a Democrat, whatever your personal views are, goes into that pot where it could tip and it could add to a lot of things that West Virginians are against being voted in if the House tips toward the Democratic Party. I, I hear you, but this is where people have to give some faith to me because I don't work for the Democratic Party. I work for the constituency of West Virginia, and whether I agree with something or not, I'm going to vote the way the constituency wants me to, and in the best interest of West Virginia. And that's one of the things. I'm a moderate, okay? Call me a Democrat, call me a Republican, whatever. I am a rabid moderate, and I will work with anybody to get the job done. I will also out people who are obstructionists. Obstructionism seems to be the new governance, and it's just wrong. You know, there's a case right now in Jefferson County of the people that didn't show up for their jobs as county commissioners, Krause and Jackson. Yeah, exactly. That's not governing. Just saying no is not governing. You have to have a plan. You have to come up with 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 reasonable things and be willing to compromise. I'm not talking about compromising your values. I'm talking about meeting some way halfway. And that just isn't done right now. You know, this started way back with the Tea Party, and I get it. They were outraged, and it was strictly fiscal. Well, now it's gotten doubled down with the Republican Party, and nothing gets done. We need to bring this back. Uh, Joe Biden and John McCain were good friends. They are on opposite sides, opposite sides of the aisle, and they still came together to get things done. Joe Manchin has been very effective at this, all right? And that's, and that's kind of how I want to follow this. Matt Miller. You just mentioned fiscal. Um, On your website, I'm looking at one of the questions that kind of leads into your website where you ask, fed up with politicians creating culture wars instead of balancing the budget. How much of the emphasis of what you would like to do in Congress is financial? That's Congress's job. (laughs) It's the only thing they are supposed to. It's their number one job per the Constitution is to fiscally run this country, and they don't do it. They come up with other things. Um, and it's just, it's ridiculous. It's, um, and how often do you hear, you know, people talking about trans issues in West Virginia, trans issues. All right. It's, you know, even, even, um, even illegal immigration has become a culture issue. West Virginia is hemorrhaging people. We've, we've gone from four congressional seats to two. All right. And, you know, so they they make up all these things rather than just doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is, one, passing a budget on time, and it needs to be balanced. And, oh, by the way, I don't think it's that hard. It just takes a little bit of courage. We we did have a woman killed here in Berkeley County during this month who uh, the alleged killer was an illegal alien. Okay, that's really, really unfortunate. Um, That's actually really horrible, and I'm sorry, but... How many how many people have been killed in West Virginia by uh, by people that are just high that are on that know, that happens unfortunately, but that that woman wouldn't have been killed if we didn't have an open border. And let me also add then, as we're talking about the border, how much does that open border impact the financial state of our nation when you look at um, things that are being given to those who are coming into our our nation illegally that affects budgets? I, 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 I hear that come up over and over and over again. So first off, Ronald Reagan had it right. His immigration uh, policy, his plan was to, I can't believe I just said Ronald Reagan was right. Yes, he was. <laughs> is, hey. Um, Reagan doesn't seem all that far right any longer. Does I know he, he doesn't. He, he actually seems really moderate. Um, so uh, so what, what, what his plan is, is, hey, document them, all right? Um, give them a taxpayer ID number so that they can pay their taxes, all right? And they are going to come in and do all the work that, quite frankly, we won't do. And, and he had I, an amnesty declaration as well. All right. And the, the other thing, too, is amnesty is an abused program. All right. Not everyone coming over is being, you know, politically persecuted. 
But right now, that's the only tool that there is because the system is so broken and it needs complete to be completely reformed. All right. If all, let's say we could magically s seal up the border. Okay. Well, do you like cantaloupe? Oh, most definitely. Okay. If you could find one, it would cost you 45 bucks. Okay. All right. We're not out there picking cantaloupes. All right. It's, it's, it's the, it's the, yeah, but it's, it's, it's Chicago where they came out and they're talking about the aldermen are talking about the fact that they, the, uh, the mayor's asking for 75 million more dollars. And these aldermen in the inner city are saying, wait a second, you guys took our after school programs in the last couple of years because we didn't have any money for it. And now you want to give all this money to help the migrants. Because again, we've broken the system. So we need to scrap the entire system and redo it and we need to stop shifting money around like that and again it's a hot it's a hot topic you know i hear people in in god in tucker county talking about this problem with illegal immigrants you know people over in wheeling talking about the illegal immigrants i'm not i'm sorry i'm not seeing them obviously there are few here if someone was killed but i just I don't get it, and we need to get off that because, quite frankly, West Virginia has a whole lot of bigger problems to solve. But all, all of us, any anytime you have money come out of your paycheck for tax dollars, a lot of our tax dollars at this point are going to support illegal aliens and, and I don't take think care that, of I don't think that's true. I, I, I would like is to the see money the money coming out of thin air? Or? Well, I want to see the numbers. I want to see where those numbers actually are. I'm a numbers guy. I haven't looked at those numbers, but I will. And I would invite anyone else to actually look at what the actual numbers are, not alternate facts, which, oh, God, I hate that. I would like to, if we could, discuss in the final few minutes some looming uh, issues with Medica uh, sorry, uh, Medicare and Social Security, uh, both of which, speaking of paychecks, you contribute to out of your paycheck, uh, but at this point, we don't have enough workers contributing to make up for the number of people who are receiving benefits or will soon, me among them, be receiving benefits. The baby boom generation was people born between 46 and 64 and as they go through retirement and live longer that's draining the system this is why the balanced budget is so important by the way no one ever asked me so how are you going to balance the budget okay spent 39 years in the department of defense i know where the waste is okay no one ever wants to touch defense well guess what we have to touch defense we have to get out of this mindset of just dumping billions and billions of dollars and I'm not talking about money for the service members. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about the stuff that gets wasted. And there's so much waste. I'm not talking about cutting um, defense civil servants. However, imagine if we could take some of the civil servants that don't do a whole lot in the Department of Defense and moving them over to Homeland Security and opening up that. And... And if you could just take the waste that we have in the Department of Defense. Where did you see waste, Steve? Can you give us an example? Waste is, okay, so AAA V program. Um, we need to be able to get Marines ashore. Um, the requirement was it had to go over the horizon, so about 30 miles, and you can't have it take all day to get there. So it has to move very quickly to get the Marines uh, from the amphibious ship to the shoreline. So they're talking about something that had to travel about 40 knots. Well, guess what? The engine is so big that you can't actually fit Marines into it. General Mattis, when he became Secretary of Defense, was the first program he cut. We spent $4 billion on that. Do you know how many AAA Vs the United States Marine Corps got? Zero. That's what I'm talking about. Did the federal government get its money back? No. Of course not. Why not? Because we assume the risk. Only in the Department of Defense, only in the federal government, does R&D costs fall on us. Any other industry, if you know, price it, you know, you want to set up a radio station, you have come up with a new whiz bang idea of how to do it. You're assuming those risks on whether it's going to fail or not. The way our defense system is set up, the industrial complex, as it were. The way it's set up is the government assumes all that risk of this R&D. The other thing that's wasteful, um, the Navy wanted a replacement for frigate. We call it a littoral combat ship. 
they said, okay, let's have two of the biggest ship uh, building companies each build one to our requirements and then we'll pick the better one. All right, cool. We'll down select. <laughs> okay. Congress, when it came time to down select, the Navy was ready. And Congress said, nope, you got to buy both. <laughs> that is two supply chains, two training platforms. And by the way, the entire program is a complete failure and we're now scrapping them. That's the waste I'm talking about. How, how, how much could we bolster Medicare and Social Security and everything else if we stopped wasting that money? You know, 60 Minutes had a thing on the Navy and its attempts to build new ships and how futile those attempts have been over the last several years. It was, uh, within the last year, how much money has been wasted because they can't get the specs right and build a ship that's functional for the Navy. That's frightening. Well, it is. And the thing is, is the stuff that we have that's proven is actually amazing. Um, both my son and my son-in-law are both uh, on Arleigh Burke class destroyers. Amazing. By the way, all those missiles coming out of Iran, Arleigh Burke shot down a, a good-sized chunk out of them. Nice. All right? It works. The A-10 works. It's a great plane. Just start building new ones instead of flying 30-year-old aircraft. Steve, we are out of time. Okay. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. And uh, you've got uh, about six months, a little less, till Election Day. How yep. can people find out about your campaign? That's WendelinForCongress.com. If you can uh, say it, you can spell it. Uh, when Del in W I N, I'm excuse W E N D E L I N. I love radio. W E N D E L I N. Wendelin uh, for Congress dot com, and go out to my website. Take a look. This is very grassroots. Uh, I need you all to spread the word. One more is one too many. Thank you, sir. Steve Wendelin at nine o'clock at a 